All right, so we're going to start a new series of lessons. Good morning, brother. Good to see you. Uh, in Sunday school for uh, several weeks, uh, we're going to begin a theological study on the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, and I think it's a really important subject to study. Uh, but let's pray first, then I'll get into it, and uh, off we go. And Father, as we begin this new series of lessons on the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, Father, I pray that you will open our understanding and our appreciation for the person of the Holy Spirit. We'll bless this Sunday school hour now. We pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Baptists have a tendency to kind of ignore the Holy Spirit. Uh, out of a fear of not wanting to be uh, associated with those who uh, abuse the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, primarily charismatics. Uh, and because of that, we unfortunately tend to not give the due that is owed to the third person of the Trinity uh, and we uh, largely tend to ignore him and don't look at him a lot and this is unjust that we do this uh, you know a lot of a lot of Bible believing Christians because of their fear of being associated uh, with that movement of uh, Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, and not wanting to be misunderstood, have a tendency to not let the Holy Spirit of God move them uh, and are afraid of having right emotion and behavior uh, to the point of where, you know, if, if, if Sometimes it's like looking at a, a sea of stone statues sitting on their hands. Uh, and we don't need to be that way. Okay, there's, you know, you can take things too far to the other, in the other direction. So, in the introduction to this, uh, the term they would use in a theological school would be uh, pneumatology. Uh, but what we're, you know, again, I don't go in for a lot of that, but, you know, what we want to look at is we want to look at the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we believe in the Trinity. We believe that God is made up of three distinct personalities, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and all three are co-equal. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at this. I mean, the Holy Spirit was sent by God the Father and by the Son to indwell and to guide believers. Uh, he is the active agent in our salvation. When a person uh, believes the gospel, and exercises their faith, it is the Holy Spirit of God who is the active agent in an individual being born again and having their spirit uh, born again and is their sealing agent. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives as believers in the church age. And so it's very important subject, I think, for us to study. Now, many people who profess to believe in the Holy Spirit uh, believe in God the Father, 
in truth, believe in God the Son in truth, but they treat the Holy Spirit kind of like a lesser being, more like a servant or an errand boy. Uh, some even to the point where they, they, they talk about the Holy Spirit like it was more of just a, uh, an energy as opposed to a person and a personality, a power, you know. Well, he has power, okay, but no more or less than the other two members of the Trinity. He is a being. Uh, he is a, a person, a personality, and that's the, something that we need to remember about that. You know, he, he's not a battery. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, and again, you know, the thing we find with, with the charismatics is they, they treat the Holy Spirit like a battery, like a power charge. You know, I'm going to go plug in, you know, and, you know, then I can, I can babble and roll around on the floor and bark like a dog and, you know, uh, all the other silly stuff that they do. Now, in this lesson, where we're going to be beginning here is we're going to look at the Word of God, and we're going to approach it so that we can see the Holy Spirit as a person, not just an influence. He is a person, and just as much as our Savior is a person, just as much as God the Father is a person, okay? Uh, you know reading the scriptures, you're going to find that he can be approached, or he can be shunned. Uh, he can be trusted, or he can be doubted. Uh, he can be loved. He can be hated. He can be adored. He can be insulted. And he can be grieved. He can be lied to. Uh, not a good idea. <laughs> okay. So the doctrine of the Holy Spirit of God is very important, very critical. He is a living person. And you know, like I say, Baptists, you know, uh, ever since the you know the charismatic movement, you know, beginning back in the, the 19 late 19 teens, 1920s, and all, you know, they, they they've kind of gotten a, a bit of an aversion. To the Holy Spirit of God and yet he is the person of the Trinity who is here with us who indwells each and every one of us who is with us 24 7 he goes everywhere we go he hears and sees everything that we do uh, he's and he's here for a great many reasons uh, in our lives now what I've done is Rather than taking and writing stuff out as you all have seen me do with my notebooks, I thought it was a lot easier just to use the theological study notebooks that I have and work on outlining them. This makes it a little less work for me, you know, uh, and you're still going to get all this. So that's why you don't see me with my typical big uh, eight and a half by eleven notebook here and have this here with me instead. Now. Go to Matthew 28:19 with me. Matthew 28, verse 19. The scripture says, "Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them." And pay attention to the wording here: baptizing them in the name singular of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Not in the names, okay, but in the name, okay? The name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit, is the Lord, okay? Uh, they are co-equal, and they are one. They are um, in a perfect unison with one another. Uh, so again, the doctrine of the Trinity being that the Godhead, God, okay, is not a singular being. 
God is a trinity made up of three distinct personalities. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, misunderstanding this is what affords uh, two of the greatest branches of cults or heretical sects out there uh, in their interpretation of the Godhead. Uh, there is what is known as Arianism, A R I A N I S M, Arianism, uh, where the Godhead is treated as being uh, in a order of authority and importance with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You know, and you know, so the Son is inferior to the Father, and the Holy Spirit inferior to the other two, and in some cases isn't even treated as a God at all. The other is your charismatic groups, where you'll have those that you know they take where Jesus said, "He that has seen me has seen the Father." And so they, they equate the Father and the Son as being the same being. And the Holy Spirit as just simply being an influence. This is what uh, it is, you'll hear me refer to as those that teach uh, oneness, uh, like T.D. Jakes, T.D. Right? Uh, heretic. Uh, you know, they, they teach that there is just one God and he has manifested himself in different ways but it's only one personality you know which means that you know uh, I guess Jesus Christ when he was at his baptism the Holy Spirit came down and, and God the Father spoke uh, you know that he was being a psychotic schizophrenic I guess <laughs> multiple personality disorder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and you say to yourself, well, how in the world can somebody, because they don't believe the Bible, you know, that chances are in these cases they're not even saved here. You know, what they're trying to do is they, they're teaching something that the Bible doesn't say. Uh, at all. I mean, we have so many instances in the scriptures where it's very clear that there is a trinity. Uh, but, as Paul says, and I see, I, I'm getting this way more and more as time goes by in my life as a Christian and as a pastor. Let the ignorant be ignorant. You know, it gets to a point after a while where there's so many, so many idiots out there like, you know, how, how much time am I supposed to spend? You know, I don't waste my time trying to correct them anymore. What I do is I expose them. I warn people. But a lot of these people, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't give T.D. Jakes five minutes of my time. I wouldn't waste my time with him. He's not, to me, he's not worth it. Uh, rebuke him, maybe, that would be about it, because he's led a great many people astray. Now, if the Holy Spirit... We're not a person. If you were merely a influence or a power, referring to him in the neuter as it, okay, would would be correct. But you're going to find in the scriptures, as you will actually find, even with the Lord Jesus Christ, that he not only is he sometimes referred to in the neuter. Uh, with pronouns, but of course he is always referred to as a he, and whenever the scripture is referring to the Holy Spirit as a person, he is going to be given his proper pronoun of he in the scripture. And he's not just an influence, he is not just a power, he is a person. And if he's a person, then we have a responsibility to know him and to know him 
intimately and more personally. Again, Bible uses you know personal pronouns in referring to the Holy Spirit. Example would be in John fifteen twenty six. John chapter 15, verse 26, Lord is speaking, but when the Comforter is come, one of the titles that he is referring to, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, again, you know, Spirit is in a capital S, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, if you were just a power or an influence, you wouldn't refer to him with a personal pronoun. And again, God the Father, God the Son are all he, all male. They don't have any confusion about that. They don't need neutered <laughs> personal pronouns. Uh, some fools, you know, uh, let's see, also uh, in 16, if we go to 16, verse 8. And when he, verse 7, gives us the context here, speaking again of the comforter, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Skip down to verse 13. Howbeit he, the spirit of truth, Okay, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, this is one of the truths of the Holy Spirit of God. He didn't come here to be a witness and testimony about himself. He didn't <coughs> come here to lift up and glorify himself. He is here... Primarily, number one, to lift up, to glorify, to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then to be a comforter and a help and a guide and a strength uh, to the believer. You know? And this is, you know, again, one of, the, one of the problems that you'll find in the charismatic movement, you know, uh, where they get all hung up on of the Holy Spirit and... You know, the, it's always it, you know about the spirit, about the spirit, about the spirit, about. And yeah, I'm not he, I'm not here to talk about me. I'm not here <clears throat> for me. I'm here for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't take anything away from him. And like I say, that's where a lot of Baptists, <laughs> you know, have have gone wrong and gone too far in the other direction. Uh, with that which is unfortunate because it shouldn't be that way you know. but you know uh, and like I say you have those that have taken you know this whole thing of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit you know to such an extreme and out of the context of the teachings of the scripture you know you know, where they go, oh, well, you know, you have to have the evidence of the Spirit in order to, you know, have the proofs that you're saved and the evidence of the Spirit and, you know, babbling like a fool, uh, you know, dancing around with snakes, <laughs> you know, some of the other stupid things that people have done, uh, which the evidence is going to come out in and of itself that you're saved okay uh, we walk by faith not by sight uh, salvation is something that we trust and believe in by faith uh, we don't need to have you know fireworks and you know huge emotional outbursts and all of that you know those those aren't an evidence or proof of anything uh, whatsoever can that happen? Can those things? Yes, but they're not required. And nowhere in the scriptures are you going to find that said. Uh, verse 14 also, there in John 16, it says, You know, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of my. Again, he's being referred to here with a personal pronoun. 
Now, an interesting thing, uh, again, not a big one on the Greek either, but pneuma is the Greek term for the spirit. It is a gender neutral term. Okay? So, when the Lord makes the point of being specific with that personal pronoun there, uh, that gender specific pronoun at that, telling us plainly that the Holy Spirit is a person, as much a person as God the Father, as much a person as the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, 12 times in John 16 that you'll find the Holy Spirit referred to with He uh, in that. Uh, Go to Romans 8.26. Now, Romans 8.26, in fact, go to Romans 8.16 first. We'll look at some reference here. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, here we've got a pronoun, okay, referring to him. That is not a he. But he's certainly referring to a person because a power or an influence, okay, can't be a witness to you. And then verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with growings which cannot be uttered. Well, again, a, an influence, a power, an energy is not capable of doing that type of an action. That requires a personality to do these things. You know, now, you go into your fake Bibles uh, that are out there, like you know, RSV, New Age, uh, ASV, and and the other bunch of them that are out there, you know, they, because they think they're smarter than God, uh, and they, well, you can't refer to the Holy Spirit as a it, you know, and they will always change it over to some sort of a personal pronoun. But that's not correct. Uh, I mean, like I say, you know, we're going to find places in the Scripture where it, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to uh, with a pronoun that is gender neutral, referred to as an it uh, in there. And that's exactly how God intends for it to be. But again, they think they're smarter than God, and so they will translate the word uh, into uh, something that it's not, and because they got to help God out because he doesn't know what he's doing. No. Now the work, and this is this is usually the case here, is whenever you find the Holy Spirit being referred to as it, it's referring to the work of the Holy Spirit of God, which indeed is going to be gender neutral and doesn't require a gender specific pronoun as he or him or himself uh, in these things. Numa. Uh, where it'll talk about uh, these things. So when you're speaking of the Holy Spirit, if you're talking about him as, you know, his personality, him, then of course that's how he spoke to you. But you can speak to the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, in that gender neutral mode and be absolutely grammatically correct in what you're doing there. Uh... You know, he has personal characteristics that, you know, just a, a energy isn't going to have. Uh, he has power. He has a capacity to love. He has a capacity for grief. He has an intellect and intelligence and knowledge and willpower. Just the same as God the Father and just the same as God the Son. 
He can be resisted. He can be lied to. He can be greedy. You can't do that to a battery. <laughs> you know, the battery don't care. <laughs> uh, all right, so. That's kind of the introduction of it, if you will. So we're going to kind of get into the meat of this a little bit more now. Go to 1 Corinthians 12.1. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. I'm sorry, I said verse 1. Verse 11. But all these worketh that one and self same, capital S, spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay. So, number one. All right. The Holy Spirit has willpower. He has a personal will. Okay. And that's why we read this here. The Holy Spirit has the capacity to make decisions. The Holy Spirit has the capacity to choose. He has a will. Okay. Again, evidence of him as a person. Number two uh, would be in Nehemiah. Chapter 9 and verse 20. Back a little ways here. Nehemiah. For Esther. Nehemiah 9 verse 20. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. And withheld it not thy manna from their mouth and gave us them water for their thirst. The Holy Spirit has intelligence. Okay. Now an influence or an energy or a power doesn't have intelligence. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have knowledge. It doesn't have wisdom. It doesn't have understanding. Uh, so it doesn't have the ability to teach or to guide. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who the scripture says, searcheth the hearts of men. Okay. He knows the mind of men and the mind of the spirit of men. And he makes intercession, as we read earlier, for us. <coughs> uh, to make our prayers acceptable unto God the Father. Okay. Uh, he searches. He has the ability to know things. Um, also Romans 8.27 in that point. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Number three. The Holy Spirit has knowledge. And again, we read uh, back in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit.